Okay, Yuri, why don't you take this one? Yuri, are you still with us? Dr. Cruz, I am with you, uh, but I don't see anything. I, I just oh, I just see white screen fault. so far. That's my fault. I'm sorry. I just realized I didn't turn it on. <laughs> Let's see if that works better. Um, How's that? Okay. Yeah. Okay, now. Good. Now. So, so it's easier to it's easier to do this when you actually have the images in front of you. Okay. That's right. Much easier. Um, so. An X-ray on um, on the left uh, with uh, associated uh, MR MRI. Uh, uh, the middle one is a oblique coronal, and the uh, one on the right is an axial. On the X-ray, there is a, a calcified uh, fragment noted uh, in the region of uh, supraspinatus attachment. Um, this is also seen on the MRI um, with a signal intensity consistent with. Uh, cortical bone. So I think the findings are consistent with uh, um, uh, calcific tendonitis, tendinosis. Well, I think you got the diagnosis right. However, uh, this typical, this is not cortical bone. In fact, actually, why don't you look up for us, and we haven't done this in a while, look up for us the, the difference between calcific tendonitis and uh, calcium power, uh, CPPD deposition disease. And, okay. uh, and see if there is a difference between the two. And then most of this, this is generally a milk of calcium. Here, John can tell us because he's actually seen this in surgery. Uh, what you have here is, is something that looks like uh, toothpaste when you uh, open that uh, area up and uh, take the calcium out, just like toothpaste. And it's not, uh, you don't make a diagnosis of calcific tendonitis. I think that's a clinical diagnosis. A calcium deposit uh, or consistent with something of that sort. It's definitely not bone. I've never seen bone in that area. Okay. And so this is often termed calcific tendonitis. Uh, but again, this is this is a term I don't like these itises terms, as you all know, unless there's a real indication that acute inflammation is going on. This term is way overused, and it, I think it leads to a lot of incorrect treatment, especially sometimes with with uh, steroid injections. Because very often, what people mean when they say tendonitis is that they they're actually talking about an acute partial tear. And if you put it in the correct terms, then the, the treatment is going to be different than if somebody treats it for an inflammatory condition. So I actually think the, the wording is important here. And I think radiologists really should get away from using the itis term unless they actually know that it's inflammatory. And with MR now, we can actually make those determinations awful, often. Here's another example where we can see what looks like low signal uh, areas within the uh, bursa here, the excuse me, uh, uh, subdeltoid bursa. And here we can see those collections of uh, low signal. And this is also can be called calcific tendonitis. Uh, again, these are collections of calcification, and, th and that's why we have uh, uh, the low signal intensity. Now, now here's a 57-year-old female with intermittent shoulder pain for several years after a body, body surfing uh, accident, happened to be in Costa Rica. Uh, and then she developed immediate, just out of the blue, intense pain. And this is now four hours after the pain started. Uh, and this, the pain actually was started with uh, uh, when she was doing yoga. And so we did an MR scan looking for a rotator cuff tear. Uh, Aram, what do you think here? All right, so. Once again, we're seeing a abnormal supraspinatus tendon, increased signal, tendonotic in appearance period. In the distal tendon, there's a focal area of low signal on the T1 and T2 weighted sequences, compatible with a area of calcification. It looks like the calcification is actually in the tendon here, as opposed to the opposing adjacent bursa. So again, I'm unclear about the terminology we're going to use, but uh, basically calcium deposition. Yeah. 
And if you've noticed, this is really more associated with the subscapularis, and there's actually a recent paper published about this. But notice here that there's edema in the surrounding soft tissue, and see how it actually extends into the muscles. There's been no injection here uh, in this particular uh, individual, uh, but it's extremely painful. And uh, if uh, she put a heating pad on this, it made the pain much, much worse. Ice markedly relieved the pain in this particular case, and now we can see it again here. So this was on 4509. By, uh, uh, the x-rays actually showed that it was calcium, and so it looks like uh, uh, calcific tendonitis. Uh, <clears throat> there was a big debate then as to whether to remove it surgically, to go in and uh, with the, uh, interventional radiology, Kenny Chen wanted to go in and remove it, and uh, she refused, just like Kenny Chin's wife refused uh, when, she, when she had the same condition. This happens to be my wife. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, so this was six weeks later. And at this time, oops, oh, oh, uh, her, or while her symptoms got, went away, I finally talked her into getting another MR. This is now 14 months after the symptoms were, uh, were relieved, and it's gone. No intervention procedures, nothing. And uh, I wanted, I'd love to have imaged this six weeks after this started when she became asymptomatic, but I've had a number of others of these, and these will spontaneously get better. And one thing I'd like to go back on this particular one, notice that there is a lot of edema within the muscles. This is probably a true inflammatory condition. And in this particular case, because of all the edema, and it was really hot, inflamed, if you touched it, it was really warm, this was probably true inflammation. And uh, probably due to the calcium uh, 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 phosphate deposition in the tissues, uh, which can produce an inflammatory reaction. So that that's this is probably that case. But she's better. Uh, again, this was started like a number of these. Often you you can't find the inciting event. It just starts, and it can be extremely painful. Uh, I, I think that sometimes partial tears kind of kick these things off. Uh, well, also. Small microscopic tears is what actually relieves the symptom. What happens is uh, it, the calcium just ruptures out, and then um, there's a absorption of the calcium into the tissue, and it disappears. Most calcium deposits, I'm sure you know, of, are not symptomatic. They're just found, and the, they're, they're sitting there for, and then something sets it off, uh, an inflammatory process. Trauma, I suppose, is probably can be implicated. You know, we know a little bit more, and maybe Yuri can help us with this if he does the investigation. We know, but you don't have to go into gout. We know a little bit more about how gout produces inflammation. Gout has these long gouty crystals. They're actually imbibed by macrophages, and they actually rupture the cell, causing the cell chemicals to extend out into the uh, interstitial tissues, and they that's what produces the severe. Uh, inflammatory reaction in gout. And I don't know that it's understood exactly how CPPD does that, because as John was saying, some of these people will have the same radiographic findings, not MR findings, but radiographic findings, and some will be totally asymptomatic and others will be extremely symptomatic. This was extremely painful. Oh, Much more painful than a rotator cuff tear. It looks painful because you can see the fluid around there, uh, edema, and, uh, which is fluid, and uh, it, I can feel for that patient whom I know. Now, in this case, the calcium deposit we're looking, it is in the tendon. Is it adjacent to the tendon, bursa? Where are we, where is this localizing to? Well, you can see the images as well as I can. Uh, it's my guess in a situation like this that it, there's probably involvement in both the tendon and the bursa. I think it can be either or both. And as we'll see in a minute, it can involve other areas as well, which we'll see in a future case. Okay, so this is. Uh, uh, can I yes. So, you know, the thing that is, you were saying that you might have an accident prior to this. So, is it like an um, ossificans? You know how you'll get an ossificans? Uh, I guess the question is, could this be my, like myositis ossificans? Uh, uh, myositis ossificans probably is where you have an actual 
partial tear or a tear of a muscle, hematoma formation, and then in the healing of that, you actually get true ossification. With uh, CPPD disease or calcific tendonitis in that category, you don't actually get ossification. You probably somehow get a uh, biochemical process where calcium salts uh, uh, come out of solution into the soft tissues. And I'm sure it's really a biochemically mediated response. And, and I don't know the details behind that. Uh, if somebody can find it, that would be a great addition to our next lecture. Uh, maybe Yuri can find something on, as to why that occurs. But I think it's still pretty much an enigma. I don't think it's really well understood what really causes CPPD deposition. Um, for this, uh, you don't need trauma. It can be set off by just for no reason. Uh, a person can actually wake up with a severe pain, and uh, just like a wry neck. Myositis, that's a different ball of wax. We're here as a tendon, and myositis is always from trauma. Uh, and it, it usually it's from direct trauma, uh, like a um, football field where somebody uh, tackles a uh, running back, for instance, and it hits them right and directly into the thigh. And it's totally two different uh, situations. So again, just the nap, so the progression is this, calcium salts, coming out of solution in the tissue. Now, tissue could be in tendon, bursa, adjacent, both. Um, but we're talking about, at this stage, at least early on, amorphous calcifications we're talking, if we had, like, radiographs to look at it. Okay. Yeah, well, you saw the radiographs. It, it's, it looks like a chunk of calcium, but in reality, it's not cortical bone, like it may look. Right. Okay, now here's a, let's see, uh, Susie, why don't you take this one? So similar to the other, the first study, we have this abnormal Christcentric um, deposit, we're calling this calcium. And then when you look at the MRs, you can also see the dark signal intensity corresponding to what we have on the plain film. And if we're continuing the theme, then it would be <laughs> calcium deposit in the supraspinatus tendon area. Okay. But, uh, what else is involved here? So, um, oh, what's that? there's abnormal increased signal intensity within the bone marrow as well. So just as you pop that up, it was like eroding into that bone marrow causing. One of the things that can happen with this disease is you can get an erosion of the bone where the calcium is deposited. Now, exactly how this occurs is also an area of debate. If you notice, these are often in locations where we typically see erosions all the time, where, which we know are associated with partial tears of the tendon. And they probably have something to do with the traction injury and the, the change of the mechanics with partial tears of the tendon at the insertion site. And whether or not it's the, the deposition of the calcium, which produces an inflammatory response that then eats away the bone, or it's an injury to the tendon which has caused bone erosions like we see day in and day out of the greater tuberosity, and then calcium deposits in that location is something that can be debated. But notice here, if this is a fat-suppressed image, that there's actually a lot of bone marrow edema adjacent to this erosion, which suggests that you may actually have an osteitis reaction of the bone adjacent to the site. So uh, I think there's a lot. And here's just on a low-field scanner, throw some of these in, another erosion at the location of calcium deposition. But again, notice this is a typical place where we see erosions all the time. So what's cause and effect is something that I think is still very much debated. And my guess is it's a little bit of both. I think all of those mechanisms probably play a role. And some dominate in some people and others in other people. That uh, generally, if there is a mechanism that can do it, it, typically they can all come into play in a patient. What's the per What's the preferred term we should be using then? If calcific tendonitis is a, you know, we're getting too uh, clinical with that, what term should we be using if we want to be really good with language? <coughs> well, maybe Yuri can tell us a little bit about this tomorrow. <clears throat> uh, I think a lot of it depends locally upon what's used in your community. 
calcific tendonitis is a common term, and I'm ha I'm okay with it if you see edema in the surrounding muscles. I'm very uh, not unha I'm not really happy with it when you just see calcium deposits without any surrounding edema. So uh, probably uh, calcium deposition within the tendon being being I think being descriptive is actually better than putting a fancy word on it when the fancy word isn't the correct word. John? Well, I think that's absolutely correct because uh, the acute phase where you have inflammatory changes, um, uh, you can take care of that problem by washing out the calcium. I'm sure Susie has done that before because I have uh, without x-ray control. But anyway, uh, uh, but, but uh, it just comes out like toothpaste, and uh, it's just uh, the happiest people are the number one, the patient, and then number two, the doctor. Because you'll probably get a Christmas gift. Uh, <laughs> not not anymore, but in old days. <laughs> Susie, do you have anything to comment about it? Okay. Okay, Sean, why don't you take this case? Um, okay, well, it <clears throat> looks like a CT arthrogram with uh, contrast within the joint space and there appears to be several calcifications um, uh, in addition to the uh, contrast. Uh, what that appears to be in the rotator cuff and then there might be one in the subcorcoid bursa um, on the axial image. And then one where the little red circle just popped up. So I would think they're... So, so what do you again, think? This is to rule out a rotator cuff tear. Um, I don't see any contrast in the subcorcoid subdeltoid bursa so I think the uh, rotator cuff is intact, but uh, there's probably, again, uh, since we're on the topic, calcific deposits um, within several areas in, in the joint. Yeah, well, this is that same patient on an MR examination, and I just want to show this to have you be careful. This could look very much like a partial tear of the undersurface mm -hmm. of the rotator cuff. Uh, this could just be a little contrast going out into the tendon and not going all the way through, but because it's in the calcific tendonitis section, we know it's calcium instead, <laughs> but, but, just, but just be aware that, that sometimes these can fool you on a CT scan. If you're thinking rotator cuff tear, you always take a step back if it doesn't make a lot of sense and say, you know, calcium can be there also, and it may be a different disease process than I was thinking of when, I, when uh, the test was ordered. So that's what this is. This is, again, a little, it's a low field scanner again. We can see calcium deposition there. So, uh, uh, this was not a rotator cuff tear. It may be a partial tear where calcium is deposited there, and that may be part of the pathophysiology that allowed the CPPT de deposition, but uh, uh, it, it's it's certainly not a full thickness tear, and the primary process here would probably be in more in the calcific tendonitis uh, ballpark rather than cuff tear. Okay, uh, let's see. Sheila, did you join us? Yes, I'm here. Oh, good. Okay, why don't you take you this case? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, there's a 70-year-old female with severe shoulder pain, and it looks like at the insertion of the supraspinatus tendon, there's focal areas of low signal intensity, um, which look like it could be um, calcific deposits in this patient. Um, and then there's marked abnormal signal intensity on the fluid sensitive sequence. Um, but this looks more, I mean, it's throughout the muscle, throughout the entire supraspinatus muscle within. Um, so this could be, I don't know if it's like a muscular strain. Um, there's a CT. And then on the CT, it looks like there's diffuse calcific deposits throughout these supraspinatus muscle. Um, so it looks like the whole muscle is in, in kind of um, yeah. invaded with calcific deposits. Yeah, I think they went in and actually uh, got some tissue here, and this turned out to be CPPD deposits throughout that area. So that's a little bit more generalized and massive. John? Well, if it affects the muscle, it's no longer tendonitis, it's myositis. Yeah. So Specific tendonitis and myositis, right. Okay, uh, let's see. Aram, why don't you take this one? So let's see, we got an 
arthrogram views, two axial arthrogram views. Uh, the subscapularis tendon perhaps is a little tendinotic. Um, there is high signal in the tendon. Um, I suppose that could be calcium. Calcium could show high signal as well on MR. Uh, again, tendinosis, high signal. I don't know what, huh. this here. what is going on here? I, I just want to point this out. And that uh, this, uh, this, uh, this was actually a normal subscapularis tendon. It's just that when they put the needle in, you can see some of the contrast here in the muscle. This was an anterior injection. They went through the subscap, and you see this all the time. And you can get extravasation of contrast along the needle track, which can be absorbed by the tendon, and it can look like a lot of different pathology. So when, when you see this, you just have to go out to the muscles to see where the injection site was. And it, it's one of the reasons why if we can get by without contrast injection, we're often better off because sometimes these can be very misleading. But just be aware that contrast is also bright in, in structures. And this was just iatrogenic. And it can get very diffuse like this and look like tendinosis or a partial tear, but this is all extravasated contrast. Calcium, although typically is, I think, low low on the both sequences or the T1 and T2 weighted, it can be variable. Yes. If you get more of a milk of calcium, like you sometimes get with CPPDD, you, it, it actually can uh, have increased signal intensity within an, on an MR study, on a T1 weighted. The, the interface can shorten the T1. Uh, you can see this also in some discs that are, become calcified in the spine. Uh, it's usually low signal, but occasionally it can be high signal. Yep. Okay. Anterior shoulder pain. Susie? Yeah, I'm looking at that. Again, I'm not sure if that's artifact or real. <laughs> It's got a red box around. <laughs> okay, so we'll take it as real, I guess. So, um, okay. Because I got kind of spooked when you were talking to Aram about the injection, so now I'm like scared to say something. <laughs> okay, uh, let's move on here a little bit. Uh, Yuri, what do you think of this case? Okay. Um... So we got uh, two axial views of, of the shoulder. Uh, there's abnormal signal intensity within the uh, subscap uh, muscle uh, um, tendon, and uh, I don't really see the uh, uh, biceps tendon. Um, uh, I'm wondering if it has been uh, dislocated. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, it's going to so, be right here. This is the biceps tendon. This is an older okay. scan. And we do not have fat suppressed images here. But the, the main thing is this little increased signal intensity within the subscap. We can see it on the T2 as well as the T1 weighted image using an older technique. And this is an interstitial partial tear, which can be symptomatic, uh, treated conservatively. Uh, you will see a lot of signal intensity within the tendons with the technique we use these days, which is usually a PD fat set in the axial plane. Uh, and th this signal is generally put under the term of tendinosis. It's a, really, it's a tendinopathy, interstitial biochemical changes like we talked about before. Uh, if you use the old, older techniques, which we don't use in the axial plane anymore, but we do in the coronal plane, oblique coronal plane, uh, they're much more specific for actual partial tears rather than tendinosis. But that's not a really important issue in the subscap usually, so we don't have these anymore, and we would just call this some some mild tendinosis of the subscapularis. Uh, and we can't really be more specific than that because we no longer use these T2-weighted images, which are more specific. So we're in the category of subscap disease. Here's another case using kind of more of a modern tech, a little bit mo modern technique, though not everybody would agree with my techniques as we've already talked about. Here's actually increased signal intensity within the subscap on the sagittal T2, non-fat suppressed. On the PD fat suppressed, we can see linear high signal intensity. Uh, this is very characteristic of an interstitial longitudinal partial tear. These can be symptomatic, but again, they're not really surgical conditions. Uh, tend to let them 
let them heal. So that's a subscapularis partial tear. Uh, <clears throat> Here again, we here we can see increased signal intensity. Uh, this is also partial tear. And remember that we've talked before when you get partial tears of tendons, especially near where they attach bone, they're very commonly associated with eros bone erosions in that location. Uh, and again, we're seeing this just like we saw in the suprascapular insertion and inf and, and subscapular uh, and for in infra I'm sorry, supraspinatus and infraspinatus insertions. We can see the same mechanism here in the uh, subscapularis. And uh, these are really due to partial tears uh, of the tendon in that location and avulsion injuries. Another example of partial tear of the subscapularis. Now, what we're starting to see here is one of the common causes, and this is a major source of anterior pain in the shoulder. Uh, we can see that there's actually an abnormal long head of the biceps tendon here. It's more elongated. It's not nice and oval or almost round like we typically see. It's more elongated, and it's starting to go over the lesser tuberosity. And, and, and this is called perching of the, of the biceps tendon. And then uh, I think it's the next lecture. I'm going to talk to a classification scheme that we like to use, classifying these lesions into seven different types. Again, you don't put that in your report, but, but it lets you know what to look for. Uh, in, in, this, in this disease. In this particular case, we can see an erosion and uh, lesser tuberosity next to it. Uh, in more severe disease, we can actually see uh, complete tears or full thickness tears. And again, these can be full thickness in the sense that a tear goes through and through from the deep to the superficial side of the tendon but part of the tendon may still be intact, either more superior or more inferiorly. So you don't get complete uh, proximal retraction of the muscle. Uh, so a lot of, but we typically talk about full thickness tears uh, in, in this setting. And then you can also see complete rupture and more uh, proximal retraction of the tendon. But typically where you have a full thickness tear, you'll see a little bit of local retraction. And here we can see the tendon is kind of serpiginous and not straight, uh, again, on the low field scanner. Uh, now, and, and then here we can just see a very large partial tear, probably some calcification within the tendon here, but this was a traumatic. Oh, I'm sorry. And here we can actually see that there's a in the chronic longstanding tears of the tendon. When they heal, they can actually heal with ossification within the tendon, which we've seen which we saw in the knee uh, in the setting of Pellegrini Stieta disease. And we'll see in the foot and ankle, there are a number of characteristic locations where you get injuries to the tendons. And when they heal, they actually heal with ossicle formation. And a lot of these ossicles in the past were called normal variants, like the os perineum. Uh, they tend to be occasionally symptomatic, like an os perineum or uh, uh, but in, in, in that setting, it's probably in the setting of the acute injury or the subacute injury or recurrent injury. But one of the healing mechanisms is ossification in that, in that area. And this is different from what we saw before, which was calcific tendonitis, because notice this has a calcium rim and there's actually fat within the middle of it. So this is actually a true ossicle, and you can see it nicely on the plane films. Uh, yeah, I, I think these are hematomas from uh, tears and bleeding. Uh, and that, now that's a little different from a degenerative tear where there is no quote unquote bleeding and or just um, calcium deposit for interstitial problem. So I think this is a little different. So again, the, the ossification is important here because we're in a whole different category of symptomology and a whole different category of disease differentiating between this and the deposition disease. Yeah. When, when you see ossicle formation, you're dealing with a chronic longstanding problem. And the ossicle is mature healing at that stage. Whereas when you see what we saw before, which is in the category of calcific tendonitis, that's often uh, more subacute or acute and, uh, and, and really not chronic. Because generally, when we follow people with calcific tendonitis, quote, uh, the, the few that we followed, it, it tends to go away. A lot of people in the past have said it's there forever. Ossicles are probably there forever, but the acute, pure, true calcific tendonitis in the way we've d discussed it with quotes around the word uh, uh, tends not to ossify.
and tends to not be permanent. Yeah, like for instance, myositis ossificans, when it matures, it doesn't go away. It's bone, it, it never goes away. And the same thing right here is when once you have an ossicle, the only way it goes away is surgically. And then another one forms, that's why you don't want to do surgery on these. Well, you can once it's chronic, uh, and then, but they have to be symptomatic. But there's always that danger of having it recur. They never operate. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, they never operate on myositis ossificans until a year goes by, and you have maturity. Never, because it'll come right back in a worse shape than it was before. And obviously, if you do pathology in that kind of acute stage, it can look very malignant. So. That can be very misleading too. And it can be extremely disabling because when you cannot bend the knee past a few degrees, uh, uh, you got a problem on your hand. And if you make it worse, you're going to be winding up in court. Okay, and then there's here's the ossicle on the plain film, which we can see right in there. Okay. Let's see. Who do we have next? I forgot where we were here. Let's see. Uh, Sheila, why don't you take this case? Okay, so 50-year-old female, pain three years post-op. It looks like she has post-operative changes at the insertion of the subscapularis tendon. Um, there's quite a bit of metallic artifact, but I think that we see maybe the subscapularis tendon uh, actually... I mean, it, the muscle looks markedly atrophied, and then I see this low signal linear area, that's, which I think is the subscapularis tendon. So it looks like maybe it's failed surgery. Okay. I mean, it's kind of at the level of the labrum. This is probably the tendon itself. That's probably the end of the tendon. What do you think this is? That could that could be scar, scar in situ. It's probably scar in situ, right? And this was a failure of the construct. Because the scar in situ is not mechanically uh, viable. I mean, it's it is there, but there also be uh, thickened fascia. Uh, so it's... But 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 this is an indication that the the basic construct is uh, no longer intact. So we had seven things that we were supposed to look at and comment on the report whenever you're doing an MR study. Uh, for uh, evaluating rotator cuff tears, which is virtually every time you do an MR of the shoulder. Uh, one thing that uh, we haven't covered yet is the status of the biceps. Uh, oh, here it is. So, uh, again, this is a grading system of seven different grades of the bi of biceps tendon disease. Uh, it's something that we've kind of used since 2000. There have been a couple of papers since then that have taken up pieces of this. Uh, but but uh, we've we've got several different categories that we've put in that I think are important that I haven't seen in any of the papers. Uh, but we're going to have a whole lecture on the biceps, so I think that'll be our next lecture, and we'll go through all seven of these all the way through biceps ruptures and go through how they look. Just a little bit about this: you, a major uh, problem anteriorly causing anterior shoulder pain is where you get partial tears of the subscapularis and uh, instability and subluxation of the biceps tendon uh, in this particular area. And uh, very early on, back in the late 1980s, in fact, uh, we were a little bit surprised when we started doing MRs of the shoulder and found that occasionally we would see the biceps tendon in here in the joint space. The overall subscap tendon looked like it was completely intact, so, and, and the biceps tendon itself wasn't ruptured. So how did it get from over here in the intertuberous groove through the area where the bicep, where the subscap inserted on the lesser tuberosity into the joint space. And that whole mechanism has been worked out in, in uh, detail since then, and we'll, we'll talk about it. But that, that'll be our next lecture. Other things that you can see with subscapularis, here's a big complete rupture with proximal retraction, which we can see here, and more fatty atrophy. And notice the difference in the signal intensity within the subscap versus the other muscles. This is more an acute disuse uh, uh, a disease of the of the muscle. Notice in time, if you if you image this a year later, it would all become a fatty replacement. 
but right now you're in an acute phase where we have disuse and you get an edema pattern in it, very similar to if you got rid of the nerve supply and you get the edema pattern within the muscle. It's kind of a transient phase of a uh, uh, muscle on its way to, to muscle atrophy if, if this isn't repaired. And this, this would be due to disuse uh, because the tendon has been completely ruptured as opposed to uh, interrupting the nerve supply like we've seen in some of the other muscles. So that's a complete uh, avulsion. Uh, in young kids, another thing that you can see in the subscap is actually avulsion of the bone. As we've talked about over and over again, the tendons and the muscles in the young kids tend to be very strong. It's the bone that's the weak link. And this is just another example of that. And you can see this is a bony avulsion. Here it's avulsed off. And I think here's the CT scan showing just a little telltale sign of a little nubbin of the cortex being pulled off uh, in, in this kid and normal physis here at the core cord base. Uh, but in, in younger kids, this is in the 10 year olds up to about you know, eight to 13 year old range. Uh, this is the injury that you would expect uh, in, uh, rather than a tendon or a muscle injury. It sure looks like it's a lot bigger piece of rock on the team. The donor side looks a lot more prominent in the tiny little piece. Yeah, well, and I, I, I think that's the case, but I, I but this is what the CT showed. I would have, I expected more calcium along here on the CT. Yeah, I, I did go back and forth and I actually found the one with the most amount of calcium on it. So, but still it was a little bit of a mismatch. And then you can get, here's more of a chronic lesser tuberosity avulsion. This is actually the lesser tuberosity that's been pulled off. Once they get pulled off over time, they can actually grow. They can get, actually get a nutrient supply and they can actually grow just like loose bodies in the joint spaces can grow. And, but that's a lesser tuberosity avulsion from uh, Philip. And here's just another example in one of ours for a 29-year-old male. And we can see this big ossicle that's been pulled off. There's a subscap tendon attaching to the uh, unstable body, and you can see the biceps tendon going along with it. In, in normal individuals, um, normal meaning that uh, the that this subscap hasn't been injured, uh, it's a very strong, thick tendon. Uh, when, when, when you do surgery, and you, we'll talk about that later, it's, um, you hate to cut through it because it's, uh, very, very substantial. It doesn't, it doesn't look as strong on MR, but then you're looking at chronic problems most of the time. Okay, and 29, and then here, here it also shows this big ossicle here that's been pulled off. And we've already seen this, we don't need to see any more of those. Uh, okay, uh, Yuri, what do you think of this case? Okay, so we got an uh, axial and a uh, sagittal MRI. Uh, there's abnormal signal uh, intensity within the uh, myotendinous junction of the subscap. Um, and uh, uh, it, actually, it's kind of from the region of the middle glenohumeral ligament. Um, um, so I, I I think the abnormal signal intensity represents uh, a at least a partial tear, and it looks like the biceps tendon may be superficial to the um, to the subscap uh, tendon. Uh, this is probably the long head of the biceps. That may be the short head over there. Okay. And then we're seeing the tendon here and something there. And this may be edema in the musculotendinous junction, or this, these are a little bit thicker cuts. This could be partial volume of some of the fluid next to it, kind of looking over here, kind of sharp margins there. So that's what we're looking at. And it turned out there is a congenital condition where you can have a, bi a bifid subscapularis tendon. Uh, this patient really had no symptoms in this particular area. Uh, so, uh, and it, and I agree with you. I was a little concerned that there could be an injury here, uh, 
but this patient actually went to surgery and they felt that this was a congenital bifid uh, subscap tendon. That's an arthrogram, Yes. If that's an arthrogram, it makes you wonder if somebody injected some dye into that tendon area and bifurcated it. Kind of separated it out. That's certainly possible. Okay. Uh, Sean, what do you think of this one? Um, again, 50 year old man looks like uh, with radiating pain down the arm. Um, they're ruling about rotator cuff tear. So there's slightly increased signal in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa overlying the um, super, overlying the rotator cuff. And there's a little bit of edema also in the deltoid muscles laterally. Um, so, um, you know, you could have a deltoid muscle strain um, and partial tearing. Good. Yep. And uh, in some uh, some conferences I've been to, when it's been asked of the sports medicine surgeons, what's the biggest miss or the most common miss they see on MRs by radiologists? And frequently they'll say deltoid muscle injuries. So it's a good idea to always look at that area. Here's just another example. We can see edema on the PD fat sat, axial and coronal images. A little bit of increased signal. In this also has a deltoid tear with probably a little bit of hemorrhage in it. Uh, oh, that reminds me. I had an interesting case today that I need to show you guys. This will give it away. Uh, Sheila, what do you think of this one? Okay, so there is abnormal signal surrounding the tendon. Okay, the, this is an athlete who got injured playing. Uh, this, mm. this probably, I'm sure this isn't a uh, major league baseball pitcher with this amount of fat, but this could be. This could be a typical injury in a major league baseball pitcher. In a pitcher, okay. So, is this? I can't tell if this is. I mean, this could be the bi. I don't know if that's the biceps. It doesn't look like it's in the normal location for the biceps. So it looks like there's more markedly abnormal signal around the tendon. Right. Maybe so we're in here. So, right. And and this is. This is not an uncommon athletic injury. And if you don't look at the most inferior slices of your shoulder examination, this is a very easy one to miss. And it's been a problem in a number of uh, Major League Baseball pitchers with the Angels. And some of these have actually led to the players being traded. So it's an area that you really need to look at. Uh, and this, and it typically, this is the Terry's major tear but it's almost always you see it in combination with a latissimus dorsi tear. And okay. as we talked about before, the two muscles that really correlate, the strength, the two muscles whose strength really correlates with the ability to throw a fast uh, 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 fastball in baseball is a pectoralis major and a latissimus dorsi. Latissimus dorsi and the teres minor uh, internally rotate the humerus and also bring the humerus down. And so they're really important in that mechanism. They both attach pretty much linearly at the same location in the anterior aspect of the, of the proximal humerus. And, and, they, and they pull the arm down and internally rotate it. Uh, here's just another example. This is on a high field scanner. We can see the edema down here, interruption of the tissues in that area, typical location of the marrow edema going out or, or the hemorrhage into the soft tissue planes. Uh, back here, this is more posteriorly, and in this particular area down in the axilla. Here are the oblique sagittal images showing the edema in that muscle. This is uh, coming back from actually behind the glenoid, but the, the main finding here really for the latissimus dorsi is his fluid collection down here. Uh, these are problems. Now, the anatomy here, if we look at it from posteriorly, oops, let me see here. This is the teres major muscle. It's much bigger than the teres minor. Here's the teres minor. We talk about that all the time because we can see it all the time and we look for it. But underneath that, notice that the teres minor attaches dorsally on the humerus and therefore is an external rotator. The teres major inserts on the anterior part of the humerus and therefore when it contracts, 
it is going to internally rotate the, the humerus. And here's the teres major coming around where it uh, originates back here. Um, now, the long head of the triceps, here's the teres major. The long, the, the long head of the triceps comes right down here, right along beside it. In the case that I'll show you guys in a minute who are here, uh, we have a strain primarily the long head of the triceps, but also of the latissimus dorsi. Uh, and that's the long, uh, yeah, that's where it comes. And then if we look at the latissimus dorsi, which comes up, and if, if we look first over here on the right-hand side, what we see, the pectoralis major in search anterior to the inner tuberous groove where the biceps tendon goes. Then just posterior to that, we have the latissimus dorsi insertion and the teres major. And they insert right next to each other, and they have very similar mechanisms uh, of action. And in fact, what we can see here is that the latissimus dorsi comes down and is a very broad muscle. The tendon comes up here and attaches to the humerus, but it has a very broad origin of the muscle uh, throughout the back going down into the lower back in that location. And here you can see how it can pull the, the humerus down. And since it goes uh, anteriorly and attaches anteriorly from behind, uh, it also internally rotates the humerus. So here's a 22-year-old uh, cricket ball, uh, fell catching a ball, cricket player fell catching a ball. And here we can see a lot of signal abnormality down here. This is not an acute, this is more of a chronic one. This is hypertrophic bone formation uh, where the, the tendon has been uh, pulled off in that location. They were concerned about neoplasm. So this is actually in a chronic injury and you can see this is the, here's the biceps tendon coming down here and uh, the, the attachment of the uh, teres major and latissimus dorsi. And there's a lot of uh, hypertrophic bone formation here and this chronic injury in that location. Here's the CT scan where you can see all that ossification, and there's the surface rendering of that, and there we can see it furthermore. And that's just a chronic injury at that origin. So involving Terry's major and the uh, latissimus dorsi. Okay, uh, any questions? Yeah, one thing to always remember is since these are not common, but certainly not uncommon problem in athletes, and they can present with shoulder pain, you can have a situation where you have a significant latissimus dorsi injury, but it's outside the plane of your shoulder imaging. So just remember that, because if you're then going to be discussing the case with the orthopedic surgeon, always keep in the back of your mind that if the mechanism of injury was correct, it could be a latissimus dorsi injury or even, I guess, a proximal teres major injury, but it might be outside your plane of interest. And therefore, you might have to get larger field of view imaging to pick those up. Uh, the people we work with at the Angels are familiar with that, so they'll, if they're concerned about it, they'll often request larger field of view to evaluate the latissimus dorsi. All right. Uh, Ron? All right, looks like we have two large field of view, uh, coronal views of the upper thorax and then shoulders. Looks like on the in the image on the right, which is probably a stir image, there's an increased signal right in the hmm, The, I guess, I don't know, I think we're beyond the deltoids here. We're trapezius? Okay. We're in the, the trap, so muscle strain tear of the trapezius. Yeah. If there's a muscle, it can always be torn. So you just have to remember, all these people present with shoulder pain. And uh, often the clinical information we get is not all that specific. So uh, uh, be sure and look around for... For all the possibilities so i'm sure that, okay so why don't we see any questions i first thought that was a deltoid yeah. but i guess but we have the supraspinatus and then yeah. 
Remember, the deltoid attaches to the lateral acromion. It doesn't go in toward the neck. This study is, is proximal to the end. See, this, oops, this is the uh, distal clavicle, right? So the deltoid is already attached to the coracoid, which is much more lateral than this. So, a chromium. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so we're we're far too pro, too medial for the deltoid. So the muscle up on top here is the trapezius. Right. Rob, I just just a brief uh, question on just how to generally discuss like muscle injuries. I mean, there's you know you have tendon tears and attachments and like you know tears at the muscular tendon junction. But then when you kind of get into the body of the muscle, I I get a little vague in terms of my talking a strain versus a tear, partial tear. Well, if you want to talk about strains, ST, not SP, like in ligaments, um, a strain uh, means uh, the, the muscle or tendon is pulled and you have an interstitial injury. Uh, there is microscopic injury, which is type one or grade one, whatever you want to use. And then a partial tear, which is a, a grade two, and a complete tear, which is a grade three. So it's partial... really not that, a, you know, the main thing is you don't want to miss a grade three. Tendon muscle, but the head never can fix it. Don't have no problem. But tendon, you want to fix many times. Not always, but sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Depends on the area. There are a number of different published grading systems for muscle injuries. And... Uh, I think most people kind of go along with what John has said, but there are a lot of there are a lot of more detailed ones. There's separate ones for MR versus ultrasound. You know, the bottom line is that they start with something. Well, the earliest symptomatic tears are probably negative by all imaging studies, and I'm I'm absolutely certain that I have been involved with a number of muscle strains which were highly symptomatic but where the MR and the ultrasound were both negative. So I, I, I firmly believe that that is a low grade area that has a very good prognosis. But uh, you know, the first grade would be one where the imaging is negative and they're, they're symptomatic. And then, then it's really a continuum as to how much damage is involved. And some of the papers have shown that in terms of prognosis, probably the only thing that's, the thing that's most important is if it's a complete tear with separation or if there's a large hematoma formation. Uh, large hematomas, more than two centimeters, have a delayed healing compared to those that don't have large hematoma formation. And, uh, but, so, so what I think you should be is descriptive again. I think, I don't think these grading systems are very helpful. And, and I think people, a lot of people put a lot more emphasis on those that they should. And I'm sure if you, well, I haven't really looked at it. There's probably some in the literature, but my guess is if you if you showed the same studies to a lot of different people, you'd get grading, you, you wouldn't have very much reproducibility in the grading system. I think it's a lot like slap tears, which are both both by MR and by surgery. Uh, the grading system is, is not reproducible. So again, I think it just need to be descript descriptive in that if you have large hematoma formation, or if you have really separation in the fibers, which is usually filled by hematoma, then you need to be you need to describe that in detail, and, and that's a significant finding. And there are some things people do. Some people will go in and try to give uh, clotting factors and and take out the hematoma. Sometimes in athletes, if they're trying to speed the repair process, but in in general, you know, they uh, muscles heal. So you get a seroma, a hematoma, it's virtually impossible to extricate from muscle. So it, once it turns to serum, yeah, then, then you can uh, take it out. But you can also cause more injury. So you have to be a little careful about that. I, I don't know like aspirate hematomas. That's the worst. In my opinion, I don't think that's a good idea most times um, because you can cause infections by sticking needles. And you have to use an 18-gauge needle. Uh, and that's not uh, too, uh, especially in uncertain condition, sterilizing. Any other questions? Okay, we'll do it again tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you.